Today, no informed scientist claims to know if a lab leak caused COVID. Putting the odds at zero or 100% is propaganda because too much early information was suppressed to allow certainty. What we do know is that COVID's costing us something like 20 million lives and $20 trillion. So anything adding to the significant odds that it was a lab leak should forever be avoided with horror. Such is the practices of a notorious US government program called PREDICT. PREDICT funded teams to go into places like remote bat caves to find novel coronaviruses and bring them back to labs with awful safety records in Wuhan. This program may well have contributed to tens of millions of deaths, which really shouldn't qualify it to have an even bigger and riskier follow-on program. But it does, and I know this factually because I write science fiction. Pause for laughter. I first researched the dangers of unnatural pandemics for a novel, which led me to give a somewhat panicked TED talk in 2019. A few months later, COVID sent me down a thousand hour rabbit hole of research, which I eventually presented to the top biosecurity people at the National Security Council and other places. Through this, I learned about this new program called Deep Vision, which is spelled like that, and literally nobody knows why. <laughs> Predict found 1,200 novel viruses over eight years. Deep Vision plans to find 10,000 over five years. Then like Predict, they're going to take these disease vectors and store them in labs of varying quality, but this time in American cities and suburbs. Then unlike Predict, they plan to figure out exactly, exactly which of those get viruses could cause terrible pandemics. These viruses won't just be weapons of mass destruction, they'll be the worst ones ever because no nuclear bomb can kill like COVID and COVID's mild compared to the viruses this program could find, making their genetic recipes doomsday codes. And Deep Vision could find several of them, whereupon they plan to publish those genomes to the entire world. Tens of thousands of people across dozens of countries could then easily make these viruses from scratch, and some of them have scary bosses. Now, no sci-fi writer would ever come up with a story this stupid and impossible to believe, but it's true. And most of it's laid out in an interview I conducted with MIT evolutionary engineer Kevin Esfeld, which both Sam Harris and I published to our podcast listeners back in February as part of an ad hoc effort by several of us to stop this crazy train. Now, I think we will succeed, but it's insane that we have to. So how the hell did we get here? Well, the people who build careers poking at insanely dangerous viruses are an insular group. They can be very, very resistant to outside oversight or even opinions, almost as if outsiders aren't informed enough to be entitled to opinions. As a small, insular community, they were long left to their own devices, with insiders awarding grants to other insiders, or peer reviewing each other's papers, or approving each other's uh, safety practices. This is a common phenomenon, it's called regulatory capture, and it caused the financial crisis, as well as countless smaller disasters that didn't make the papers. When regulatory capture harms auto safety, or global prosperity, it's obscenely wrong enough. So do we really want to let small cliques gamble with hundreds of millions of lives as a means of advancing their field? Do we want echo chambers in charge of doomsday safety? Well, every top expert says it's safe. I know because they all told me we we're on vacation together. <laughs> Open sourcing doomsday viruses only makes sense if you think you're so much smarter than the, than the bad guys, it doesn't matter what they know. But we're ethical, which makes us harmless, and they're stupid outsiders, which makes them harmless. That is schizophrenic arrogance in an individual. But group minds go crazy all the time when everyone who's entitled to opinion starts repeating each other. And biology is not the only danger zone. So is AI and nanotechnology, some crazy shit that we only we science fiction writers know about. So back during the Cold War, just two people had the power to cancel fut the future and trillions were spent on weapons, surveillance, and ghastly regional wars to deter the use of that power. Strange as it sounds, flirting with the apocalypse was a public good back then. It was practiced by huge governments with excellent, brilliant teams that were very cautious, examining every angle. And it was all done for the public goal of avoiding future world wars. But we're entering an era of privatizing the apocalypse. And if we outsource doomsday decisions to anybody with advanced training in the wrong fields, 
we won't have trillion dollar deterrence budgets for all of them, so let's not. That was uplifting, right? Yeah. Hey there, thanks for watching, I'm Brady. And I'm Firein, and we're the people behind Ignite Talks HQ. The speaker just watched was in a race against time. Every Ignite Talk is 20 slides, and the slides change every 15 seconds, whether you're ready or not, so you've got to keep up. It's out of control. Could you do this? <laughs> we think so. Follow us in the usual places to learn more about how you can give a talk. And don't forget to subscribe for more speedy talks. <laughs>